I'm Derek Weeks. I'm vice president at Sonotype. I am also a co-founder of the All Day DevOps Conference. Uh, it's coming up on November 6th. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about some research I've been doing for the last five years uh, into open source uh, software development, open source projects. Uh, and I hope that you'll find it really exciting. As part of any organization's journey to excellence, it begins when the organization ceases to sacrifice quality for speed. This is really important. When we're thinking about DevOps and improving our practices and our organization, it is not just about speed. But all of you have probably read the State of uh, DevOps report from Dora, right? And that talks about speed. That talks about organizations that are deploying 67 times faster than their peers. Their change failure rates are 2,600 times lower. They're, or they're 2,600 times faster uh, to recover from failures than their peers, right? It says that these organizations that are moving faster than their peers are more profitable, they have higher market share, and they also have more satisfied employees and developers and folks in their DevOps practice. So why can't we just move fast? Right? Why is this not important? Well, the other thing that we do know from the State of DevOps report is that the exemplar organizations are 1.75 times more likely to extensively use open source within their environments. Now, this finding from the State of DevOps report actually led me and my colleagues at Sonotype to intersect with folks like Gene Kim and Dr. Stephen McGill uh, and a bunch of our security and data researchers to uh, um, get together this year and work on something called the State of the Software Supply Chain Report. Now, one of the things that we were looking at that's important to DevOps and the open source development community is that we knew in the state of, or, or in the Phoenix project that Gene Kim wrote, he said, look, if you're going to do something in DevOps, there are the three ways of DevOps that he wrote about in the Phoenix project. And the first way was understand the performance of the entire system end to end. And the other part of the first way of DevOps that people don't really recognizes in there all the time is never pass a known defect downstream. Understand the performance of the entire system end to end and never pass a known defect downstream. So the Phoenix project that all of us look to is kind of the Bible of the DevOps story that happened and, and allow us to understand it does talk about automating processes. It does talk about cultural change but it does talk about building quality in from the beginning of the, the organization. So every single one of you in this room has and relies upon a software supply chain with your open source projects or in, in your company overall. Right? Everyone has or participates in open source projects. You are the suppliers of software supply chains globally. You have warehouses like Maven Central, NPMJS, RubyGems.org, Python, the Python repository, the NuGet gallery, et cetera, where you store your open source projects. There are software development teams globally that download these software components uh, for use in their development practices. And they use those components to construct or build their applications into the finished goods. Every single one of you has a software supply chain, relies on it extensively, and I think being at All Things Open, you kind of recognize this, but I'm going to shed some light into what's happening across these software supply chains that might not be as visible to you. For this year's research with Gene Kim, we looked at 12,000 open source projects across uh, different, uh, or sorry, 36,000 open source projects and analyze them. We looked at 30 million open source component releases over the last 10 years. We examined 12,000 software development organizations 
surveyed over 6,000 developers as part of this research, and also examined over 68,000 applications built with open source components. And I'm going to share some of that research that we have uh, today. To give you a sense of how much open source is being used in software development today, we've been tracking download patterns across Maven Central, as well as the NPM repository. Last year, the approximate 10 million Java developers on the planet requested 146 billion Java open source components from Maven Central. When I joined Sonotype back uh, at the beginning of 2014, we had just seen 13 billion download requests at that point. In Java, uh, JavaScript, if you're using uh, NPM packages, you are part of the population of 6.5 million JavaScript developers that have seen over 11 billion downloads of NPM packages every week. The consumption volumes in this market are unbelievable and growing at an exponential rate. And just when you think 146 billion is really high, we will come out with the numbers next year and it will be exponentially higher uh, the, the next year with this consumption pattern. Now what this means is out of the applications that we're building, using these components that we're not writing all of this code from scratch, that 85% of the average application being built today has a footprint of open source components within those applications. In some organizations, that's higher than 95% of the application is built uh, using open source components. Now, none of you in this room has an organization where you're downloading billions of components a year. right? At best, the biggest organizations that I've seen are consuming around 16 million open source components annually, but an average organization just in Java development alone is bringing in over 300,000 open source uh, components from Java from 2,700, over 2,700 different open source projects. If you look at all the releases, it would be across 8,200 releases of those projects that are being downloaded that 300,000 uh, times. It's really awkward to like look up at a screen and feel like you're not going to fall off the stage here. So hopefully that won't happen. But all of these components that you're downloading are not created equal. If you're doing Java development and downloading things from Maven Central, do you recognize that one in 10 components that you downloaded last year had a known security vulnerability when you downloaded it? and brought it into your organization? Did you also know, if you're developing using NPM packages, that on average, every developer is downloading about 60,000 NPM packages locally? And when NPM did their own audit of how many of the packages are vulnerable that we've looked at using N uh, of our users using NPM audit, 51% of the packages developers were using had known security vulnerabilities built into those or known about those components, right? So the key thing is, if we're going to rely so much on all of these components to build the software, and more specifically, we're going to rely on, on average 2,700 different open source suppliers to help us build code that we electively chose not to write ourselves, then we wanted to seek out and, and understand in DevOps context, when faster is better in the enterprise, does faster also mean better in terms of open source? And if we're going to use open source, how do you pick the best suppliers from this ecosystem? How do you pick the best open source projects to work with? Is it just on, man, I've been using that project for the last six years. Version 2.1 works just like I want it to, and so I'm going to keep using that project. Or is it because, well, it's popular. All of my friends are using it, and I see 
you know, on, uh, in different places, in different communities, uh, where I get involved with other developers, that they're using that same component or relying on that same project, so I'm just gonna keep using it because it's popular. So we set out to do some research to identify which are the best open source projects and what attributes do we base that, that research upon. So there are differences between the enterprise and open source projects. You have multiple deploys a day within an enterprise. You have versioned releases within open source. In the enterprise, you are well staffed. You're well resourced generally, right, within your organizations. In open source, it's a little more fluid in terms of the development teams and the contribution rates to these organizations. But there are some similarities that we could measure as we set out to do this research. One is, what is the deployment frequency you know, as compared to the enterprise as we would compare to uh, open, or release frequency of open source projects? When we look at enterprises that are successful, we can say their organizational performance, their market share, their profitability is really high. In open source, we say the most popular projects are uh, clearly the most successful ones. When there's something that goes wrong, there's mean time to restore in the enterprise. And when things go wrong in open source projects, sometimes when there are security vulnerabilities or other uh, issues, what is the time to remediate those vulnerabilities? So in our research, we decided to go off and look first at uh, comparing release frequency and popularity of open source projects. In order to do this, we needed a data set to begin to work with. So at Sonotype, being the stewards of Maven Central, we have access to data about a lot of different open source projects uh, that have contributed different releases uh, over the years. We started with a population of 266,000 projects. We looked at projects that were releasing multiple times over a five year period, so we knew that they were active projects. They followed a certain uh, a standard uh, versioning um, uh, protocol so that we could get consistent versioning uh, of the projects. And we looked at those that had multiple dependencies as well because we wanted to look at the impacts of open source suppliers that relied on other open source suppliers or projects relying on other projects uh, as dependencies within these ecosystems. And we whittled it down to about 36,000 open source projects that we then dove into further to better understand their performance attributes of good suppliers versus bad suppliers within this. So in order to do this, we looked at a lot of different attributes from popularity, the size of the development teams, their release speed, release frequency, were they using CI tools, were they foundation supported, security vulnerabilities and remediation times, uh, et cetera. So our first hypothesis within this research is that projects that released frequently had better outcomes. So similar to the state of DevOps report, enterprises that release more frequently have better outcomes. They're happier employees, greater market share, greater profitability, et cetera. So what we found in this research was that projects that release, frequent, release frequently actually do have better outcomes. So they're five times more popular in general. They attract more developers to the open source project to uh, participate. And they're more likely to be foundation supported as well. So it was interesting to see just at this high level, organizations that, uh, that were releasing frequently did have good attributes in terms of uh, attractiveness in the development community and adoption rate. Then we wanted to look at uh, time to remediate vulnerabilities. Now this was a little more challenging in terms of how you actually look at it and how you assess the data, which I'm gonna walk through for, uh, for all of you. But part of this I wanna take back to uh, W. Edwards Deming. This was decades ago within manufacturing processes when Deming was advising the, the Japanese auto manufacturers, Mitsubishi and Toyota, that he was saying that we need to pick the best quality parts from the best suppliers. We need to track and trace defects along the development life cycle. We need to find the defects as early as we can within the life cycle of, of products 
and rely on the fewest and best suppliers that we can when defects occur that they can remediate these fast. So time to remediate or time to correct issues that happen within a manufacturing process also relate to kind of what we look at in terms of open source projects and their performance as a supplier. So to look at the time to remediate uh, uh, hypothesis a little more, we needed three metrics to work with. One was the time to remediate, the time, then the time to update between uh, any releases, so the time to remediate for any vulnerabilities, and whether they had stale dependencies that they um, let go or didn't update with every version of their, uh, of their project. So in order to understand the kind of things that we were trying to calculate to determine who was best at remediating, uh, I, we have a simple model that we produced within the report. So in this model, just to walk you through it, we have component C version 2.2, and that over time is going to update to C 2.3. Within it, it has two dependencies, A 2.2 and B 2.2. At some point between C 2.2 and C 2.3, B has a vulnerability discovered in it. At that time, we need to understand, we wanted to understand if the dependency had a vulnerability, how quickly did B update? Because if B updated, then the new version of C could also update with that uh, dependency, or update using the newer dependency. During the time that B is vulnerable, C is also vulnerable as a result. And when B actually fixes the vulnerability or updates its code to remove the vulnerability uh, and releases a new version, then we want to look at how fast C adopts that, uh, and that C's remediation time, as well as the update time from B uh, being updated to C being updated. We also wanted to look at when B was updating as a dependency, was A also updating? And how long was that update time? So how frequently or how, much, uh, how could we measure the performance of a supplier that knew that they had a problem related to one of their parts or one of the, the projects that they relied upon and could build that into the new part so that all of you that were using part uh, C 2.3 would not be impacted by that vulnerability. The faster they can update or remediate this vulnerability and get it to you, the faster that you can put that uh, into your environments. Every once in a while, A, uh, or a project like A, or C, I should say, will skip a dependency, so leave it stale. So this project may be releasing faster, and C may not be able to keep up, and if C doesn't keep up for a long time, it could miss not only one release, but maybe 10 releases in between C 2.2 and C2.3. So stale dependencies were also a factor of how quickly are the projects updating uh, as they go through. So getting back to the findings, uh, when we looked at these projects that had known security vulnerabilities, we wanted to understand if there was a vulnerability in the component or one of its dependencies, how quickly did that project update? So, Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at the, the performance here, the median time to update is 180 days. The mean time to update for projects with a known security vulnerability is almost a year. So if the project that you're working with has a vulnerability and you're a known vulnerability, and you're waiting a year to get the fix on that, then you have to add on top of that, how long does it take you to get that project into your production application so that you are not as vulnerable in this, uh, in this case. But at the same time that we were looking at this, we understood not all open source projects have a vulnerability that's discovered in them. There are some projects that simply haven't had vulnerabilities discovered, so we couldn't use this as the only metric. But we did see that not all projects were bad. There were some in the top 20% that were remediating very quickly, right, within a number of days. And we thought, if you're going to rely on suppliers, which would be the best suppliers to work with, and what attributes do these in the top 20% have within, uh, within, their uh, within their projects? 
So what we, we also did within the research was we looked at not only the time to remediate vulnerabilities, but the time to update on average. So as you can see, the median time uh, to update for any project, regardless of vulnerability or not, is 130 days. But overall, you can see that the update patterns for projects closely followed the, um, the update time or the remediation time for vulnerabilities from this research. So if you are going to use the best projects with the best track records for updating frequently and for also remediating vulnerabilities within the projects, you are going to want to pick between, you know, out of, out of projects that had these characteristics to update fast and remediate fast as they would be the best suppliers. So projects that, ha that update dependencies more frequently are generally more secure. So this was a hypothesis that we entered the research with, and we actually validated that, as you saw, that those that were updating more frequently were consequently staying more secure. They don't necessarily, they didn't, weren't necessarily prioritizing security vulnerability remediation, but just through uh, uh, regular updates and frequent updates of their code, they were uh, working out the uh, vulnerable code, uh, either uh, purposely or uh, just consequently as they were updating. So the other thing that we wanted to look at, or another hypothesis, was that projects with fewer dependencies would be able to stay more up to date, right? So in my example that I showed, there's one project, two dependencies uh, within it. It's gonna be easy if you only have two dependencies to update them versus a project that has 17 dependencies is gonna be a lot harder to keep all of those updated between releases. And the data actually shows us that that's false. We invalidated that. Components with more dependencies were more likely to stay up to date. So larger components or, or open source projects that had larger development teams had 50% faster median time to updates and release 2.6 times more frequently. So this is the number of dependencies that you see here on the x-axis and the size of the development teams. So we know the correlation, we don't know the causation within the data, but the more dependencies that you get, the more developers are showing up. What we also recognized was that two pizza teams were more effective than one pizza teams in this, so when you have about oh, when you have about four uh, four to six developers, you have more uh, dependencies. Uh, on average, you're updating a lot faster, and I think we've all heard two pizza teams are kind of the most productive teams uh, out there by size. So um, that was just kind of a funny thing that we noted during the research. So hypothesis number four. This is my favorite one that we entered the research with. So more popular projects are better at staying up to date. So Ken, you didn't know who this, this person was. You couldn't read the, uh, the slides before they came up. But uh, who's read the Cathedral in the Bazaar? Right? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It was published by Eric S. Raymond in 1999. And as part of that, he introduced many rules of software development, of open source software development, that still hold true today. But one of them, uh, anyone remember Linus's Law from uh, the book? What was it? Linus's Law. You've all read this like a thousand times. With more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Right? So at this time, in 1999, when Eric was writing this book, Open source was evil, right? You had to use proprietary software because it was safe and open source was evil and you shouldn't use that because there are a bunch of people just contributing any code that they want to. And the open source community developing uh, Linux was saying, if we have more people contributing to this, and we have hundreds and thousands of people contributing to this project with more eyeballs, we will find all the bugs faster than with proprietary software. And this was the thing that was quote, you know, it's quoted time and time again. Of, and it's not so much an issue today as open source is very widely accepted, but back five years ago, 
or even more, that was the argument that, that was used with why should we go on, on using open source. So with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Or with more popular projects, they're going to be better at staying up to date and have fewer known vulnerabilities associated with them because the bugs are being found by all these, uh, all these folks. So as we were looking at the data, we recognized within the, uh, the top performers that there were certain characteristics that they had. And we, re we recognized a couple of exemplar groups. There were small exemplars and large exemplars. And within the exemplar groups, some were small, average of one and a half developers. The larger ones, average of nine or so developers. They're releasing frequently. They're updating frequently. They have low rates of vulnerabilities within them. They're more likely to be foundation uh, supported. But there were also groups that we identified in these clusters of, of the analysis that were laggards. They had poor mean time to updates. They had high stale dependency counts. They weren't keeping as up to date uh, as, uh, as you would like. There were features first folks. They were releasing new versions of their uh, open source projects all the time, but they weren't remediating vulnerabilities quickly when the vulnerabilities had been discovered. So you're getting lots of new capabilities in the, from the projects, but you're not getting more secure projects as a result. And then there was a cautious group, and this was the group that was like, eh, they weren't releasing super fast, but they weren't super slow. They weren't on the latest versions, but they weren't 10 versions back. They were two, maybe three versions back sometimes. So they were pretty good at being a supplier or having the, um, the right kind of performance attributes for the open source projects that you'd like to work with. So what did we find in this data? When we did some of the cluster analysis, what you're gonna see here, the, the blue and the green dots represent the exemplars, the small and large exemplars. And what you see is they're all generally clustered up in this environment. So again, on the x-axis we have release frequency. So the further left you are, the faster you're releasing. Now these projects are also more popular. Uh, they're being downloaded much more often. They're releasing frequently and they're being downloaded more often. So if you're going to pick suppliers that have good track records, that are updating frequently, that are releasing new uh, features um, and fewer vulnerabilities, you're going to want to pick from this group. But remember, we said all popular projects should be able to update their um, update their dependencies quickly, update uh, when uh, vulnerabilities happen and remediate quickly. But there's this group over here of projects that are quite popular, but they're not very fast at remediating vulnerabilities, right? They're not very fast at updating. So these groups here, are, it's about 90 days to uh, over 400 days in terms of uh, time to update between releases. So you can't just pick on popularity alone. If you're, picking, you, if you're picking the best projects, you have to pick based on more than one attribute. And popularity can't be the single attribute that you would uh, focus on for those updates. So the, one of the interesting things about this, as we were going through the, the research, and Gene Kim had pointed this out on one of our review calls, he, was, he said, look at the beautiful curve. I was like, what curve? Like, you see a bunch of dots on the screen, right? And he's like, this curve right here, right? And notice there's no components down here. If you have an open source project, you are not releasing, <laughs> you're not releasing frequently and be, being very popular, right? If you're not popular, you're not releasing a lot. Right? If you're not releasing a lot, you're not going to be popular. I don't know the causation, but no one exists in this group. No one is releasing like three times a day and is extremely popular because they're finding out like no one's using my stuff, so why am I trying to update my project consistently? But it was pretty interesting to see these kind of patterns within the data that we had. 
So as we are going through this research and we're figuring out which projects are the best ones to work with, which ones have the best track records, which ones are updating most frequently as the projects, as the suppliers that we're relying upon in our enterprises, we also had this begging question of what are developers in the enterprise doing? How quickly are they updating any of their dependencies? Is there a practice in place for this? So in May of this year, we went out and surveyed 650-odd uh, developers. We asked them about their update uh, practices. We asked them, you know, do you schedule updates? Are you using the latest version? Is there some process of adding new dependencies? Is there a process for taking away uh, pr problematic dependencies? Do you have any automated tools to help you track or manage this? So surprising to us, we're getting all these you know, 30 plus percent back saying, yes, we have a process. Yes, we're doing this frequently. Yes, we're updating. Yes, we're using automation as part of this solution. And I think our feeling was that this was much more kind of aspirational than a picture of reality. We'd like to do this, right? My impression, I think others that were part of this were like, yeah, we're gonna get like 10% back saying, yeah, we're like, we're really doing this. We have an activity. So maybe the numbers are real, uh, or maybe they're just aspirational in terms of, it's survey data, so it's as scientific as we wanna make it. But the things that we figured out, we not only asked them, what are you doing? How frequently are you doing it? Do you have a process in place? But we also asked them, how satisfied are you with your work, right? How, how happy are you at work to be doing the work that you're doing? And what we found within the exemplars of, of the survey, the, the kind of clusters that we identified was, the exemplars were 10 times more likely to schedule their updates, 11 times more likely to have a process in place for updating dependencies, 12 times more likely to use automated tools. And when it came to considering updating dependencies painful, they were two, uh, 3.2 times less likely to consider updating dependencies painful, and 2.6 times less likely to consider updating dependencies painful when it came to remediating vulnerabilities within the code. And what that showed us was that those that had an active process around this, that we're doing it every day, that we're climbing the mountain every day, found the behavior easier. Those that were updating dependencies as the laggards, once a year, once every other year, found it painful, right? If you go out like I did in 2001 and you climb Mount Kilimanjaro to 19,000 feet, and you like literally just showed up in Tanzania and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna just climb 19,000 feet today. You're probably gonna be throwing up along the way and tired and maybe wanna give up and this is painful. But if you're the porters on that mountain that climb that mountain every day and flip flops and go up, right, up and down, it's an easy mountain to climb. So the more frequently you're doing things, the better, uh, the, the higher job satisfaction you have, the easier it becomes. And we saw similar findings in the state of uh, DevOps report from Dora, that the more frequently people were doing things, the more it became part of everyday work as the frequency and the automation and the velocity came in, the easier it became to, uh, to do. So when we also, we, we were looking at this uh, to better understand how open source was being used within software development, uh, we also want, we examined over 68,000 applications this year that were built using open source components. And one of the questions that we had were, how old are the components that people are using? So of these applications under active development, we see that almost half are using components that were developed or released in the last three years. But that also means that all of you that are using components in development are also using components that are four, five, six, eight, ten years old within your uh, applications. These app, the, like a component, and we see this all the time. It's not as infrequent, or maybe you guys know, it's not as infrequent as one would imagine to use a ten-year-old component in development today when there are like. 
40 or 400 newer versions of that component. It's like, I've been using it, it works. It does exactly what I need it to do. Why should I move to a newer version? Then I'm gonna have breaking changes and I don't wanna deal with that, right? But there are a bunch of older components being used in development. And why does that make a difference when it comes to the quality of what you're using? Well, when we look at the percentage of known security vulnerabilities in development across those applications, those that were the components released from 2017 on forward had a 65% lower known vulnerability defect density than the older components. These components on average are 15% 15, 15 of those have known vulnerabilities. If you're using the latest versions of components, just by using the latest updated versions of components as a practice, if you use components that were no older than two years old, you could drop your defect density considerably by using just the latest 10 versions uh, or 10 releases of these projects uh, in the last couple of years. So Jez Humble in his book, and this is going back to building quality in. Have you, have you all read Continuous Delivery? Jez Humble, Dave Farley, it was, I don't know how old it is now, like eight years or something like that? 10, ten years? Okay. Still a phenomenal book, right? And not buried somewhere in like chapter 12 in the middle of the chapter. In chapter one, they say, we're gonna move fast with continuous integration, but you got to build quality in. It's not hidden anywhere, it's right in chapter one. And if you're development teams and you wanna build quality in, then we look at, uh, we wanna look towards some survey data that we did back in, this was January, February of this year, we asked 5,500 developers about their use of open source projects within development and security practices within their organization. This is a, our annual DevSecOps community survey. About 3% of the people that take this survey classify themselves as security professionals. So it's mainly DevOps people that classify themselves, self-classify as DevOps or developers, IT managers, architects, et cetera. And we ask them to identify what's your DevOps practice? Are you a mature practice or are you, uh, do you have no DevOps practices in place? And when we ask them, how are you informed of application security issues within uh, the applications that you have? You see security teams are still involved and in fact more involved in the blue DevOps teams, the exemplar DevOps teams, than otherwise. Security teams are tightly knit in DevOps practices with their development practices. But the big difference is here. The tooling is informing developers of security issues within their code. And this is not security tools that we bought. We went out to some security vendor and bought some security tool and we're making our developers use a security tool. This is, I'm sitting in a meetup a couple of months ago in DC and I'm giving a similar presentation on the research data and some developer in the audience says, I just got notified from GitHub that one of my projects has a known security vulnerability in it. And I got that alert in GitHub and now I'm going to go and figure out how to remediate that vulnerability. He's not using some like IBM app scan static analysis tool or some pen testing organization to go and look at the code. It's the development tools that are telling the developers, you have a problem in your code. I'm telling you quickly, right when you're committing that code into your repo, there's a vulnerability there. You need to remediate it. It's a fast feedback loop. It's automated. It's built into the tooling that developers are using and making that practice easy. We also saw this kind of survey result within the uh, DevSecOps community survey when we asked two questions. Do you have an open source policy within your organization? And secondly, do you follow it? In the non-DevOps shops, you see that 25% said, we have a policy and we follow it. But in the DevOps shops, it's almost two and a half times higher when you're applying automated tooling into the development practices, and the development tooling is telling your developers, hey, are you using components? 
that are safe to use? Are you com using components with the lowest risk to the organization? Are you using, using components of the highest quality that meet our policies? When the automation is present to help developers make those choices, they are more likely to follow those policies because the automation is supporting them in making those decisions. And as a result, when you look at unmanaged software supply chains versus managed software supply chains, you see that the managed software supply chains are much better at taking known vulnerabilities out of their software development practices versus those unmanaged. When we looked at uh, applications built in unmanaged environments, 20% of the components in those applications on average had known vulnerabilities. We've seen large enterprises evaluate their application portfolios where 24% of the components in production had known security vulnerabilities because they weren't looking at the quality of the components that they were using within development. So with this data, with this research that we have, but with better understanding development practices, how to build security in, how to build quality in, right? how to pick better open source suppliers as better uh, or better projects as better suppliers within your development practices, we can begin to imagine qualities at insane speeds that we're trying to work at toward developing. Right? We can also imagine automating a rating system for OSS projects that, that we're working with or open source projects that we're working with. So you could identify, if I'm going to use a project, who's a two-star supplier and who's a five-star supplier based upon multiple attributes, not just popularity of the components within uh, the environment. You can imagine building secure applications. And somewhere down the line, because 85% of the applications that we're currently building are using open source components, or 85% or of the application is built from open source components, and like I said, in some places, 95%, and we know the attributes for the best open source components uh, out there, or the best projects out there, that if you give computers this knowledge to say, I need the best parts, from the best and fewest suppliers out there to build my application with the highest quality uh, attributes out there that machines could start to make the choices and machines can start to build the applications. And we've all heard that machines could start building applications at some point, right? And none of you as developers are out of a job. Your kids studying development? We'll see. Again, I'm Derek Weeks, Vice President at Sonotype, co-founder of All Day DevOps. If you want a copy of the slides, if you want a copy of the report, if you want a copy of the DevSecOps community survey, my out of office message is on today, uh, weeks at sonotype.com. You don't have to put a subject line or thank you or anything like that. If you email that, you'll get my out of office message. There are links to um, SlideShare, um, the slide deck or slide deck share or whatever it's called, um, where the slides are, you can just download them as PDFs from there. You don't have to register or anything to get those. Um, if you are not at this conference and you're watching a video of my presentation, thank you uh, for watching online. Also, if you're going to email me, my out of office message is not on when you're looking at this video. Um, so please tell me I was watching the presentation you gave at All Things Open. Uh, and I really like the slide so that I can know which slide deck to send you um, because otherwise I just get these email, like emails that come in from Joe with nothing in them. <laughs> like, Joe, do you want something? So uh, as I did mention, uh, I am co-founder of a uh, conference called All Day DevOps. It is coming up on November 6th. This conference is entirely online. We have 150 sessions. Uh, throughout the day across 24 hours. It is absolutely free to attend. You can bring 2,000 people from your organization to participate like some other organizations are doing. We'll have about 30,000 people participate this year. It's all DevOps topics. There are no vendor pitches allowed. Um, so I invite you to join that. All the sessions will be recorded uh, online as well. 
Uh, and again, uh, Derek Weeks, weeks at sonotype.com if you want a copy of the slides or the reports. Thank you.